All right, folks, thank you for coming back and welcome back to the Cyber Spotlight, the people behind security. I'm the host, Stephen Bowden, and I'm here today joined by Tim Echandia, uh, Information Security Threat Manager. Did I get that right? At the yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> Fair enough. So yeah, just tell the people here, Tim, first of all, thanks for joining the show. And why don't you just let the, the folks watching know who you are, where you're from, and what got you into the cybersecurity field? I'm Timothy Echandia. I run the... Um threat hunting program at Valley National Bank, as far as what got me into cybersecurity. My uncle introduced me to the Commodore 64 when I was eight years old, and he also taught me how to break copy protection on uh, games back when I was that young. It used to be kind of basic. You'd make a copy of a game, and the producers of the games would put errors on discs, and if you made a perfect copy, the game wouldn't run because the game would actually check for those errors as it ran. So you had to go through and mark certain sectors on the disk bad. And they got a little bit more advanced over time. So I started learning more about how to defeat their tactics because I wanted to play games. Didn't necessarily want to pay for them. Got a little bit older. I ran into a similar situation when I got my first modem. I was about 13 years old. And my first phone bill was, I think, $300. My parents were very upset and I wanted to learn how to not pay for that. So eventually when I was about 16 or 17, my friends started getting into trouble. So I got onto the straight and narrow path rather than uh, continuing my uh, amateur security analyst activities. From there, I got into a general sort of IT career. I started at Hewlett Packard, moved on to NCR and eventually moved into the data center space. In the data center space, they had a little bit more appreciation for security because we were hosting so many customers. And eventually I learned that some of the things I had been doing for fun previously were now actually valuable to the industry and people were taking notice. We were doing security monitoring, not with a modern tool set, but more of the mind of, we know the normal state for this customer, for example, and suddenly we're monitoring a bank of servers for a customer and it spikes up to 100% CPU at 3 a.m. And we're logging into their servers and asking why. And we're finding that somebody's installed a Bitcoin miner 15 years ago onto somebody's machine. We call up the owner, ask him, hey, did you authorize this? Do you know who did this? And he's like, yeah, I know who did it. I'll take care of it. But it was definitely more looking for the anomalies in your environment and then tracking those down to make sure that the activity you were seeing was normal. And this is before EDR. People had a basic antivirus, some IDS equipment, we had a uh, very basic DDoS equipment from Arbor that we were using. I mean, this is like first generation Arbor stuff where we're trying to defend against situations like um, th one, of the, one of the companies we hosted was the Internet Chess Club. And there was one of the act, one of the players there was from Russia was accused from was accused of cheating using a chess program to boost his rating got upset when he got booted off and started DDoSing that customer. And we, I, I was primarily an overnight guy. So I'm sitting there at 3 a.m. analyzing traffic and trying to shut this guy down. Over time, from there, I ended up getting my CISSP and ended up transitioning from a more of a security role by as a tangential role for me into that became my primary profession because a suddenly people were willing to invest in it and it was something I really enjoy and having, you know, job security in a lucrative field is always a great thing. Totally. Uh, that's, that's a great story getting into cybersecurity. I think a couple parts of that sound like a movie in some way, you know, the going from a kid, figuring out how to hack things and break them instead of realizing, well, it better be on the, better be on the right side of the law. Yeah, I, I, I don't like I, a couple of my friends had like, you know, secret service show up and take their computers away. And that sounded like the worst part of it to me. Looks, that sounds like the Transformers movie. That's hilarious. That's a, that's a great story on getting into cybersecurity. I think one of the best I've, I've seen. So with your current job now at the, at the bank, if you had to explain to someone what you did in an elevator just quickly, what would be your kind of elevator explanation for your, your role? 
I monitor these threats coming into the bank. I also monitor, I also do research on current threats facing the cybersecurity industry as a whole. I make sure that we have the proper tools and mitigations in place to mitigate those threats. Also share those threats out with the general community to make sure that we're doing our part to clean the environment up. If everybody took their sidewalk and kept it clean, the entire the entire environment would just be better. And we feel strongly about sharing with FSI Zach and other industry groups the threats that we're actively seeing, such that if they ended up in somebody else's environment, they might have an indicator ahead of time and be able to block it. In addition to that, I run the user awareness program. I'm the guy who sends the phishing emails out every month to make sure that our users know it's more, it's not, yeah, I would like a really low click percentage, but I also want people to report these things to us. And even when they click something that's wrong, I make sure to follow up to ensure that they understand that they, if they haven't report, either thank them for reporting it to us or follow up with them and make sure that they report it to us next time. Because the sooner I know about a problem, the sooner I can clean it up. Right. So that person in the elevator might be like, so are you like kind of like an internet Batman for the bank? Like, and how would you I would say that? I would say that would be the short version of it. <laughs> Fair enough. And like before the call, you explained that you're calling in from, from San Diego right now. So as far as misconceptions from, you know, maybe the business side of the house in the bank, if they were like, you know what, Tim, what do you, what do you actually do for the company out there in San Diego? What are, what are some of the maybe misconceptions about the cybersecurity department? that the other departments might have? I think the biggest misconception is that we always want to say no. <laughs> it's, I, I don't want to say no. I want to say yes as much as possible. I want to try to empower the business to do what they're doing, to do it safely. And I want to make sure that they have the proper tools. When I do have to say no, I want them to understand that it's not because, not because I'm trying to stifle them, but I'm hoping to be able to provide suggestions on how they can do what they're trying to do, but either with, with the tools that we have, or perhaps guide them towards purchasing a new tool to make sure that they're conducting business in such a way that it's not going to result in a breach, or we're not going to leak somebody's personal info. Right. And, and communicating to that business is sometimes difficult because it, it, it's generally it's generally an educational process. They may not understand the threat. They may not even understand the tools that we have to deal with that and making sure that that's very clearly communicated is, is, is part of negating that misconception. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. Good communication uh, would be key there for that. Since COVID started, and I mean, now it's hopefully on its way to being done. Has there been any major changes to the way that your job functions or the way, or to the things that you monitor uh, in your role? There's been an increase. I've, I've increased my monitoring on the insider threat and not even the malicious insider threat. Right. People are trying to do things like print documents and they may not have a printer in their home or a printer that's hooked up to a piece of our equipment. So either their option is to print at the office and go pick it up. Sometimes they'll try to email something out and I have to explain to them that's not allowed if that information ends up in your personal account and then your personal account would be breached were to be breached then suddenly we have a data breach for customer information so for the most part we block that information from going out and then try to educate them as to the proper processes or transition them to paperless the bulk of our workforce or the bulk of the workforce i deal with is remote right now so right. that has changed the some of the issues as far as what we see, what we see people trying to do and some of the information that is maybe not being handled as well as it was when people were in the office. Fair enough. Maybe I'll just switch up the order of the questions I had then because, you know, Pluralock's an identity centric company and how does digital identity, what, you know, like we talk about now with most of your workforce being work from home, how does digital identity play into the, the game of cybersecurity that you're trying to maintain? Uh, on your end? I think philosophically, digital identity is probably the most 
important issue currently facing the cybersecurity field. And it's probably the one from a philosophical perspective, impossible to solve. You end up trying to do your best as far as we started off with usernames and passwords. We've moved to multi-factor authentication, and sometimes that was a text message which isn't necessarily secure. Then we have apps where people have to enter in codes, and those can be stolen. I think the best implementations I've seen of that so far are the ones where the application prompts you, you press a button, and then you're authenticated. And you also need to take into account the identity. You need also need to take into account where the person is logging in from. An employee that resides in New York shouldn't be trying to log in from like the Ukraine. Yeah. And you need to take all of these factors about their normal behavior. It, it's, a, it's, it's very important. And you're going to have to collect more and more pieces of data about the user to establish an identity. But as the technology gets better, more of the factors that you're using to authenticate somebody are easier to fake. You're going to end up with something like the ship of Theseus where, well, you've replaced this many portions of a person. Are they still that person? And you're going to have to decide what that means. I think it's over time, this is going, it is going to become the most important topic in cybersecurity, the definition of who someone is and what access they should have. Whomever solves this problem is going to be incredibly rich and <laughs> it's going to open up a lot more avenues for us to share information if you can absolutely establish a unique identity for every single user. Yeah, well, hopefully we're the people that do that, but uh, yeah, that's great insight into how important uh, identity is. What would you tell someone who inspire or aspires to get into the role that you have or get into cybersecurity at in a financial institution? Like what would you say is, or what, what advice would you give them? The technology skills are going to come. If you're curious about this stuff, you're going to play with it. It's going to happen. The technology, the skills I learned, I learned in a program C 30 years ago now. I don't know how many other languages have come and gone since. C is still used. Some of the others that I learned along the way aren't. Don't worry about those. Learn how to do PowerPoints. Learn how to do Excel. Learn how to use Word. Learn how to communicate. Take your English classes. Take your history. Take your philosophy. Learn how to take your very technical ideas and communicate them to the business. If you can do that, you will go much further. Being, being stuck in a bubble in which you have the greatest idea in the world and can't sell it to the business or can't communicate it is, is not going to get you anywhere. Great. Well, a large portion of my job is taking data, turning it into information, sometimes via painting pretty pictures to the person I want to communicate it to so that they understand it. And I don't think that's a large enough focus in the industry right now. Right. Like the soft skills of, of being, you know, in, in cybersecurity management, again, like you said, explaining it to other people, that, that's super key. I think, yeah, not a lot of people, not enough people talk about that as, as a big part of, the, of that role. Just before we got on here, we talked a little bit about, you know, riding the balance of, as cybersecurity professionals, riding the balance of playing with the newest tools and the newest trends in cybersecurity that come out there versus, you know, maintaining that basic security hygiene and making sure that employees are doing that and the companies, you know, set up with the infrastructure that way. How do you kind of see riding that balance effectively in today's super modern, super, you know, diverse and exciting cybersecurity industry landscape? I think there's a lot of focus on having the newest, most exciting tools you possibly can. And there is also a lot of focus on the newest, most exciting breaches. Take, for example, the Colonial Pipelines, the SolarWinds breaches, the, the water system breaches, and a lot of those problems could have been solved by very basic security steps. In the case of the water systems that were breached, both of those were just protected. The, both of those were an unprotected team viewer session that was just guarded by a password. Something that's very easy to breach, something that 
will just follow social engineering all the time and somebody was able to get in without having any sort of multi-factor authentication. In the case of the pipeline breach, there were audits done prior to them being attacked that said they had multiple failures across the board that needed to be addressed. And I don't think without a financial incentive to do so, either via fines or via profits that many people are paying attention to those sorts of issues. I, I fall into this trap myself and I want to see the new stuff. But on the other hand, it, there is a lot of that can be done just by enforcing basic security hygiene. You need to be enabling two-factor authentication across the board for all users. I think Google said that once they did that, they completely eliminated their social engineering and phishing problem. People are frequently going to be the weakest link. So you need to make sure that the basics like that, having your inventory done, knowing what's in your environment, knowing when things are going to expire, knowing things when things are going to become end of life, having a proper inventory will allow you to understand when a vulnerability does come out, whether or not you need to be worried about it. One of the analogies I've frequently used is you say you're trying to protect an office building and you're going to have the locksmith that comes in and tries to sell you the fancy unpickable lock. That's great. Somebody else is going to try to sell you these bulletproof windows. Somebody's going to try to sell you an alarm system. Somebody's going to tell you, try to sell you a million different tools. If you don't cut the bushes around your building and you don't light it properly, you're never going to see the attack coming. Somebody is going to tunnel through a wall and get around your windows and around your security system. And if you don't have a proper inventory, you're not going to know what they took, what's been touched, what's been taken. All of the very basic security measures that you can take should be taken first. They're generally not as sexy as some of the other steps that you can take with the fancy, you know, with the newer EDR tools, but they are more important because you're going to end up failing the low hanging fruit test and there is no more security by obscurity. You have search engines scanning the entire internet every day. I believe the last estimate was you could scan the entire IPv4 space in like an hour. And I can log into Shodan and I can tell you, as somebody asked me this yesterday, well, how many exchange servers can you see connected and open to the internet? Well, I can see about 200,000, 2013 slash 16 servers and 50,000 of them are located in the US. I have monitors set up for my environment just to make sure that no abnormal ports open. And I, I think it's just making sure that you have visibility and you're alerted to changes is frequently more important than addressing these very fancy threats because if you manage to do that they'll just go away for example with SolarWinds a properly deployed SolarWinds server that didn't have access to the internet didn't have admin access and was deployed on its own instance wasn't going to be impacted by the the most recent breach. And so making sure that everything's done properly becomes more important than being aware of being able to stop the attack because you're just going to stop it by virtue of having done everything properly in the first place. Right, like in the setup of it. So yeah, yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you know, someone listening to this, if, if there's a lot of companies out there who are still based on, you know, after seeing all the news, all the recent breaches, they're still sitting there and they probably, you know, some CISOs or some, you know, executives might look in the back of their mind and be like, we don't really have our cybersecurity up, up to snuff right now. And I know that. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest, like, you know, based on the, the classic debt or cybersecurity hygiene type things, where would you suggest that they start, start making sure that they have their system set up properly? Inventory. Make sure that you know everything that you have in your environment and where it is mm. and where it's operating. I've heard too many stories and seen them. Somebody's got a server running in a closet in the back of a room. I, I've heard one apocryphal one where there was a server that was set up and it even got sealed into a room that nobody could access. And that's just a problem waiting to happen. Yeah, that, that does sound like a nightmare. So start with inventory and then go from there. That's, uh, that's good advice. I think that would be, yeah, make, make sure that you know where everybody, make sure you know where everything is, 
make sure that you know all of the users in your environment and that they have the proper level of access. Make sure that only devices that you want, make sure that only the devices that you know about can connect to your network and touch the things that they're supposed to. Right, that's just great advice. So this has been great. A lot of info in there that people can use and I think, you know, think about as, as more, unfortunately, I think news will come out about attacks like that. So thanks for that. Before I let you go here, I want to do a little this or that with you just to get to sure. know Tim a little bit better for the folks out there. Are you a dog person or a cat person or do you just not like pets and animals at all? Oh, definitely cats. I have two sphinxes. They have a web page. They, they have a Facebook page with like 5,000 followers. They're more popular than I am. So, well, maybe, maybe the cyber spotlight will change that for you, but uh, Tim's cats, you can find those online. It, sound, it sounds like. Uh, yep. Are you Mac or PC guy? PC. PC. Nice. I think you're the first person to say PC so far in our like nine episodes. I, I, I don't like Apple products so much. They, they feel, I, I don't like the fact that they lock you into using their hardware. There's not enough tinkering you can do with them. I mean, sure, you're getting a certain level of security and the attack surface is smaller because a lot of the, a lot of the malware is for Windows, but not my thing. I, I've always liked PCs. I like gaming especially, so yeah. that's just you know, where I am. Fair enough. What's your biggest cybersecurity pet peeve if you said to pick one? Actually, I think it's the current bad password rules. We're we're still trying the 12 character, 12 character special rules, and, and that's just been proven that it doesn't work. We need to go to a more modern solution that is, you know, longer passwords are better, use password managers instead, use 2FA. I mean, that's and that's often frequently just included by default in your accounts and your tools and people just don't turn it on and use it. And that frustrates me. Are you a sitting desk or a standing desk? Sitting yeah. desk. Fair enough. It looks like you got a good chair there. That makes yep. it, makes it worth it. And what's your favorite outdoor activity down in San Diego? A sunbathing. <laughs> Fair enough. Sounds, seems yeah, like there's a lot of that around. Yeah. Perfect. Cool, Tim. Well, thank you so much for joining the show today and, and providing your insight and providing your expertise in the area. How can right. people are that are watching network with you and uh, connect online? I can be found on LinkedIn. I, I, I've got a Facebook page. My private consulting page is www.orcus.com, O-R-C-U-S.com. Okay. So they can, they can contact me there or find me on LinkedIn. Okay, sounds good. We will leave those uh, links beneath the video here and maybe even the, your cat's uh, Facebook page. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. I could, I could send that over to you. Uh, I'm sure they'll love the attention. They love everybody's attention. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Tim. Have a great day and we will chat later. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for having me. You have a great day too.